If you're on here, chances are it's because you know that marriage is really, really easy, right? Marriage is the easiest thing we've ever done, done on this earth. Uh, said absolutely no one ever. Uh, you're on here, chances are you're on here because you're going through something difficult. Uh, maybe you're on here uh, just to, to brush up, to, to learn, to hang out with me. I don't know why you're on here, but chances are you're on here because you're going through something really, really difficult. Um, and sometimes there's tips and tricks and five steps towards and three keys to or three principles. Uh, and sometimes it's a little more challenging than that. Sometimes it's not a formula. Sometimes it's a season. Sometimes you're, you're going through something that you're looking for answers in. Today, I want to share with you something that's been really impactful on, on my life uh, in my 21 years of marriage to Michelle, the love of my life. But today, I want to talk to you about strength. Uh, I want to talk to you about how do we do hard things. And I was in um, my car uh, several months back take, taking my kids to school. I have a 15-year-old daughter. She's a sophomore in high school. She's a cheerleader. Uh, these are challenging times in the Chastine home. And I have a 12 year old son who's in seventh grade. And I was kind of giving them the dad pep talk. And I was on my way to school, take them to school. And I was trying to show them and let them understand that as believers, uh, we can do hard things. That there are seasons, there are circumstances, there are things in our life, and marriage can be one of these things that's really hard. And I think it's always important to pray for miracles, I think it's always important to pray for breakthrough. Uh, what I found that many times in my life, what I've found is that many times God doesn't part the waters. Many times he gives me the strength to build a boat and to get across whatever thing is in front of me, whatever challenging thing that is in front of me. So what I want to talk about today is strength. I think that strength is something that God gives us to get through certain seasons and wisdom and things like that. Um, but I know that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. And so when we look through the Bible, uh, we find people in the Bible who drew, who, who brought God's strength into their life that allowed them to do really, really hard things. And chances are you're going through something difficult. Chances are it's your marriage. Chances are it's something else. It's a sickness. It's a job. It's a career. It's a financial issue. Whatever it is, it's something difficult that may be having an impact on your marriage. And today I want to look at a person in the Bible who I love. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is Nehemiah. Nehemiah is one of my favorite stories in the Bible, and here's why. Nehemiah did really, really hard things. But what's fascinating to me about the entire book of Nehemiah is you won't find one miracle. There are no miracles in the book of Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah um, is simply God using common, ordinary people to do really, really hard and challenging things. And so God gave Nehemiah this supernatural strength to do something that God was calling him to do. And I believe that we can lean on this same strength, that whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, whatever challenges, uh, many of you, there may be somebody watching this that can't even get out of bed. You're, you're laying in your bed right now and you're just looking at your laptop, you're looking at your phone, and there's just so many things coming down around you right now. Uh, that you don't even have the strength to get out of bed. I, I pray that through this next few uh, minutes and, and, and hour that we spend together, that God's going to do something supernatural in your life, that God's going to give you a new strength to get through what, what, what you're doing. Now, listen, don't get me wrong. I love a good miracle, and I think we should always pray for miracles. I think the stories of Moses and Elijah and Elisha and all these different things that we see through the Bible are amazing. But what do we do um, when there are no miracles? What do we do when our prayers go unanswered? Uh, I think of people like John the Baptist. Think about John the Baptist. John the Baptist never saw a miracle. He never witnessed a miracle. He never performed a miracle. But when, when his life was over, um, jo Jesus said about John the Baptist in, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, uh, Jesus, Jesus said that, that John the Baptist was the greatest man ever born among women. Think about that. Jesus, Jesus is saying that John the Baptist was the greatest man ever born, and he never experienced a miracle. Never experienced a miracle. He, he did hard things uh, for, uh, for, for, for God. So sometimes God does part the waters for us, and sometimes he calls us to build a boat. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about Nehemiah. Nehemiah was called to build something, okay? Nehemiah was called to rebuild something that had been torn down. Now think about this through your own filter. What has God called you to do to rebuild? Nehemiah was called to do something really, really important. And what I would say to you is the hard thing that's in front of you is really hard, but it's important. 
anything worth building, or maybe in some of your cases, if you have a marriage that's broken or falling apart or there's been infidelity or whatever the case may be, um, maybe you're rebuilding something. And rebuilding can be very, very difficult. And this is where Nehemiah is, and this is what he's facing. He's been called to rebuild something. So I want to learn from Nehemiah. I want to learn from those who have gone before me. So what I want to talk about is we're going to look at three challenges that Nehemiah had. Okay, so here's some homework for you tonight and maybe tomorrow. Read the whole book of Nehemiah. It's a really easy read. It's a story. It's very story format. It's a, it's a, it's a really easy read. But you'll find a lot of nuggets in here. But I want to, I want to just show you three challenges that Nehemiah faced while he was doing hard things, okay? Uh, And then we're gonna look at Nehemiah's response. And what we can learn from this is when we face these similar things, we can respond in the way that Nehemiah responded and then allow God to do things through us, all right? So let's let's go to Nehemiah, all right? So if you have your Bible, you can go with me. Um, If you don't, it's cool, I'm, I'm gonna read it for you. So Nehemiah chapter four, is where I want to pick up, okay? So we're looking at this story through the lens or through the context of of our marriages, all right? So let's look at this. Nehemiah 4, verse 6. It says, so he rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. So think about this. The wall was in shambles, um, and he's been working on this wall, and it's halfway there, It's halfway back. And you may be in this position. Maybe you've been working on your marriage for a few years, a few months, and you've made some progress, but it feels like you're two, two steps forward, one step back. This is Nehemiah. It says, because the people worked with all their might. And then verse 7 says, but when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, and the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs of Jerusalem's wall had gone ahead, that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. Now, I want you to think about this. Um, there is an enemy, all right, that does not want your marriage to be healed. And this isn't a fight against flesh and blood. Flesh and blood. There, is, there is a different set of battles to be fought. And we need to be mindful of this in our marriages, that it's not just about fighting with my spouse. We need to fight against the enemy, our true, our true enemy. So it's saying that the enemy became very angry. And I want you to think about when the enemy became angry. The enemy noticed whenever it, the wall had reached half its height. Okay, so think about this. If you're making any sort of progress, you're beginning to get the enemy's attention, all right? So then it says this, it says they all, verse 8 says they all, this being the enemy, they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. So the first thing we can expect, we can expect something when we're rebuilding something, when we're fighting for something, we can expect conflict. Some of you are like, duh, John, (laughs) I'm in the middle of this one. I understand the conflict. But Anything worth building, I want you to think about it this way. Anything worth building will get the enemy's attention. So the reason the enemy is attacking your marriage, the reason the enemy is attacking your thoughts, your mental health, your anxiety, all these things, is because you're working on something that really matters. All right? So, so the, the enemy's uh, getting your attention. And I want to take you back to another verse all the way back in 2 Kings. When King Nebuchadnezzar had came to, came to tear down Jerusalem, to tear down the walls, all right? So, so I want to show you why the enemy attacked it. Okay, so in, in 2 Kings 25, it says, On the seventh day of the fifth month and the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, in verse 9 it says, He set fire to the temple of the Lord, the royal palace, and all of, of the houses of Jerusalem. Every important building he burned down. All right? And then it goes on to say, The whole Babylonian army, under the commander of the imperial guard, broke down the walls of Jerusalem. Why did they attack the temple? Because it was important. Why did, why did they tear down the walls? Because it was important. It was the protection. The enemy is coming after you and coming after your marriage because it's important. Um, I love to take my, my family, uh, well, I should say my, my son and daughter because my wife gets sick, but I love to go deep sea fishing. And anytime we go deep sea fishing, Chances are, as soon as we find fish and we start catching fish, we're going to reel up a fish that's, that's missing his whole body. All, that, all that's on the hook is the head. And what's happened is the sharks have come. So we know, we know that we're actually starting to catch a lot of good fish when the sharks show up. So what I'm trying to say is we shouldn't be surprised when the enemy shows up, when we have challenges mentally, when, when we have fighting, when we have issues come up in our marriage, when we have infidelity and we're trying to work on building trust again and then trust is lost. The enemy is coming to steal, 
to kill, and to destroy. Now, I want to look at Nehemiah's response, because this is where we're going to learn today. We're not going to learn by, by the problems. We're going to learn by the response. So let's look at re- uh, Nehemiah's response. Nehemiah's response to the enemy attacking in, in chapter 4, verse 9. He says, but, but we prayed to our God and, and there's a really important and here. We prayed to our God and we posted guard day and night. So I want you to to look at these two words, okay? It says they prayed and they posted. They prayed and they posted. Now think about it this way. They did something in the natural. They posted guard. They did something, something in the supernatural. They prayed. It's not one or the other. Sometimes, a lot of times um, when we have conflict in our life, we either want to try to fix it without God or we ask God to fix it without me being involved in it. And I think sometimes it takes both. They prayed and they posted. It's, it's good to pray. You should pray for your marriage, but you should also go to counseling, right? You should do both. You should do both. And this is what, this is what Nehemiah did. He did both. And it was really, really important to do so. So let's, let's keep going. I want to show you the next conflict, okay? Uh, the next problem, the next, the next challenge, all right? So the second thing that Nehemiah faced that if you're going through difficulty, I think this will resonate with you. Number two, the number two thing you can expect is you can expect physical and mental exhaustion. All right? And some of you are like, yep, I'm there. I'm there. So let me show you the two happening to, to Nehemiah simultaneously. Okay, so Nehemiah 4.10, it says, Meanwhile, the people of Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out. They're exhausted. They're physically exhausted. And there's so much rubble, we can't rebuild the wall. So they're, they're physically exhausted, all right? The second thing is the very next verse. It says, also, so one thing is physical, but also our enemies said, before they know it or see us, they will be right there among us, and we will kill them and put an end to the work, okay? They, then the Jews were, who lived among them came and told them 10 times, wherever you turn, they will attack you. So, they're, so on one hand, they're physically exhausted from building the wall. On the second hand, they're getting these threats from the enemy. And then their own people, the Jewish people, their own people say, they're going to get you. They're going to kill you. And so there's this massive anxiety happening in their life. This is mental health, okay? This is mental health to us. And if, if you're watching this, chances are you're physically exhausted. And chances are you're mentally exhausted. And, and this is a really, really dangerous place to be in our marriage, okay? Because we are most susceptible to do really um, unwise things when we're exhausted. Uh, a lot of times this is when marriages end. This is when the divorce becomes final. Uh, this is when uh, a spouse that's not meeting your needs, you begin to look elsewhere for those needs to be met. Why? Because we're exhausted. We just can't fight anymore. We're either physically exhausted or mentally exhausted. And so I want you to remember when this happened. It happened when they were halfway there. The wall had reached half its height. And it wasn't one or the other that caused it. It wasn't just the physical because they were physically tired before. They became exhausted when the enemy began to attack mentally, right? And when their own people began to attack mentally. This is you, you know, the enemy's attacking you. But also your friends are giving you advice and your own friends are telling you stuff, you know. So, so we can get it from both sides. And so, again, we're going to not learn from the conflict. We're going to learn from response. So what is Nehemiah's response to this exhaustion? Okay, I want to show it to you. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 13. He says, therefore, this is a really important word in the English language. He's saying, because of this, we're going to do this. So he says, therefore, I stationed some of the people behind, this is really important, the lowest points the, at the wall's exposed places, okay? So he's saying that there was some, some parts in our wall, the thing that we're trying to rebuild. So in our case, in this context, it's marriage. So there's some areas that we're trying to rebuild our marriage, but there's some low, low parts in the wall. There are some parts in it that were the most exposed, were the most vulnerable. If we're gonna mess up, it's gonna be in one of these areas. And he's saying, so what I did is I posted guard there. What, is this, what does this mean practically for us? This can mean a lot of different things. Uh, uh, contextualize it to your situation. But if you're a male and potentially a female, uh, if we're struggling and not getting our, 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 our love language met, um, 
we're very tempted to get our love language met from other places. If you're a man, it's most likely physical, right? And if your wife will not meet your needs physically, you better post a guard at that low point of your wall. You need accountability. You need to make sure that that phone, that laptop, that, that device has some sort of accountability in it. Um, where are you the most exposed? Don't be alone with the opposite sex, right? Uh, don't engage if you're if you if you're not physical touch, but you're emotional, right? You need you need the emotional support. Don't engage in that conversation with that person of the opposite sex at work. Don't answer that DM, right? Don't slide into people's DMs. There's, we're going to be exhausted. We're going to be physically exhausted, mentally exhausted. We're going to be very vulnerable in these moments. Right now, you're vulnerable. You're hurting. You're hurting. You're going through some difficult times. So we're going to post a guard. And I want, to, I want you to notice what the enemy did when they posted guard, okay? In Nehemiah 4.14, it says, After I looked things over, it says Nehemiah, I stood up and said to the nobles, Don't be afraid. Remember the Lord who's great and awesome. Fight And fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. And after they had made the decision to fight, okay? Now catch this. He says, I want you to fight. We're going to post guard. We're not going to let the enemy come and destroy what we're building back. We're not going to allow it to happen. And watch what happened when they decided to fight. And some of you need to make the decision to fight. You just need to make the decision to fight. Verse 15. Verse 15 says, When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. So you know what happened? The enemy didn't even attack. When they realized their weak points, when they, when they got ahead of it, when they were proactive, they didn't wait for the enemy to come and attack them sexually. They didn't wait for the enemy to come and attack them in the ways that we're contextualizing it to marriage. When they were proactive, the enemy didn't even attack. This is, this is awesome. And from that moment on, from this moment on, they fought differently. They built differently. And I want to show you, prior to this moment, they were building the wall back one way. From this moment on, they started building the wall back a different way. And my prayer is that this day that you're watching this, you had, you had no idea you are going to be on a Zoom call, on a, on a YouTube live call with, with John Chastine. And what I'm believing that right now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he's speaking to you. He's inspiring you to fight, to post your guard, to fight again for your marriage, to fight again for your family. And from this day on, you're going to fight differently. All right? You're going to build differently. And this, this is it, in Nehemiah 4.16. It says, from that day on, okay, so it wasn't like this before, but from that day on, half my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Watch. Those who carried the materials did the work with one hand and held a weapon in the other hand. Now think about this. They, they did the work with one hand, and they held a weapon in the other hand. So think about this. They had a shovel in one hand and a sword in the other. What does this mean? You know what it really means? It means that the progress slowed. They weren't able to build as fast. They just weren't. They didn't build as fast. But they were building it the right way. And this is a word to some of us. We're trying to rebuild our marriage. We're trying to fix some broke stuff in our marriage. And it may not be progressing the way or the pace that you want it to pace, the way that you want it to be rebuilt. My encouragement to you is to work with a, with, a, with a shovel in one hand and a sword in the other. What does this mean? It means that we should never, ever, ever put down our sword while we're doing hard things in our marriages. Okay, what does that mean? Um, don't be practical there because I don't want you to use a sword with your spouse, all right? In the Word of God, uh, it, it describes the Bible as a sword, Okay. Uh, in, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, it says, Put on the helm of, helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So my question to you is, are you in the Word? Are you, are you studying? Are you, are you looking at Scripture? You know, you know what you need to get in the Word the most? When you feel like it the least. Because I would say that right now, if you're hurting, if you're challenged, if you're going through difficult times, if you're conflicting, if you're trying to re- re- build back your marriage the very last thing you feel like doing is getting in the Word. (laughs) The very last thing you feel like doing is praying. But I would present to you that it is the most important thing to do right now. The most important thing to do right now. So we we, we fight with with a shovel in one hand and a sword in the other, all right? 
Let me show you the last one. Okay, so Nehemiah 6, verse 1. It says, when the word came to Sambalat, Tobiah, Geshem, the, Arab, the Arabs, and the rest of the enemies, that I had rebuilt the wall, and not a gap was left. So the, the wall is built, not a gap is left, but it says, though up until that time, I had not set the doors in place. Okay? Sambalat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages in the plains of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me. All right? So I'm, I'm convinced that the, the final one, the final conflict, the final challenge, and I think it's one of the enemy's greatest weapons, is you can expect distraction. Okay? This is what's happening. Now think about the enemy's tactics. The very first tactic is they started with dread. They started with rumors. We're going to do this. We're going to do this to you. It was, a, it was a rumor mill. And then they went into fear. They, then they went fear-based. We're going to kill you. They said, we're literally going to kill you. And then the very last tactic that the enemy threw at them was, was distraction. They said, if we, can't, if we can't strike fear into them, if we can't cause them to dread, then we're just going to distract them. And I think um, one of the enemy's greatest weapons, specifically in marriage, is distraction. Busyness. Um, wherever you're at in your marriage, chances are that one of the things that got us to where it is now is we've been distracted. We didn't cultivate. We didn't. We stopped doing dates nights. We stopped doing this. Kids came, jobs came, careers came, houses came, life came. And over the course of years or months, we just began to get distracted and, and didn't do the work that needed to be done. So, so what, how did Nehemiah respond, okay? I'm all about the response because this gives us action steps. So here's Nehemiah's response in verse 3. He says, so I sent them a message, and this is how I replied. He says, I'm carrying on a great project, and I cannot come down to meet you. Why should I stop the work? Um, what I would say to you is one of the really important things we all need to understand right now and just be reminded is how important this work is. Um, the hard work of building your marriage is more important than just about anything in your life because if your marriage is out of balance, many times your whole life is out of balance. And so what I'm just trying to quickly remind you of is not to quit, not to give up, to fight for your marriage, to fight to rebuild, to continue the work. And it is hard. It's very, very hard. Uh, one of the things I told my kids that day that I was giving them this, this motivational speech that they were rolling their eyes at me, one of, the, one of the things I said was, guys, we do hard things. Um, and if it was easy, everybody would do it. If it was easy, everybody would do it. Why is marriage so important? Because it's the centrality of most of your life. As goes your marriage, so goes many aspects and components of your life. It's hard work. Marriage is not easy. For the, for, for the best of marriages, it's really, really hard. So just know you're not alone. If your marriage is having challenges, welcome to the club, right? Marriage is hard, but this is what I would say. If it were easy, everybody would do it. If it were easy, half, half the marriages in, in America wouldn't end in, diver, in divorce. This is hard stuff. And I'm believing that the, that the Holy Spirit can empower you today, give you strength today to fight for your marriage. So why should we stop the work? This is what Nehemiah said. Why should we stop now? Let's not stop. So those were the three things. I want to give you one more, okay? One more thing you can expect, and I believe this by faith. I'm, I'm speaking this by faith over you and your marriage, okay? I'm telling you that the, the fourth and final thing that you can expect is you should expect a miracle. You should expect a miracle. You should pray and believe that, that, that God can do a miracle in this situation. And I know I started by saying we do hard things even when there's no miracles, but the book of Nehemiah actually has a miracle in it. Nehemiah is the miracle. Nehemiah is the seed who obeyed God, did the hard work without any miraculous signs and wonders from God. And actually, in fact, in doing so, Nehemiah became the miracle. And I think that when we decide to do hard things, when we decide to move beyond ourselves, get outside of ourselves, do the hard work of praying and posting, we're going to do both. We're going to pray. We're going to do it in the supernatural. We're going to do it in the natural. We're going to post. We're going to go outside of ourselves. We're going to try new things. We're going to get counseling. We're going to do whatever it takes. We're going to commit to this. We're going to fight for our marriages no matter what because we have a supernatural strength doing it. And we're doing it with a shovel in one hand 
and a sword in the other. God is empowering us to do this, and I'm believing that he's going to do that through you today. All right? Um, one, more, one more quick thing I want, to, I want to share, and then we're going to go to some Q&A. Um, I was in um, Napa. I was in the Napa Valley just a, a couple of weeks ago. And we're doing this tour. And I'm talking to this guy who has lived in this valley um, forever, right? And, and another friend of mine that was there who's a sommelier, just a brilliant guy. Um, these, this guy that was there that lived there could literally taste, we, 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 we could taste a wine and he could tell you what year it's from and what vineyard it was pulled from. This is how genius this guy was. And so we started talking about this and, and started exploring, you know, how the best grapes are grown. Because what I believe about you in your marriage is God really does want to produce a fine wine in your marriage. He wants to produce something that's pure, that's great, that's, that's the best for us. And he's trying to produce this in us. And what I learned about wine in Napa was that the, the most brilliant wines, right, the, 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 the most award-winning wines actually are grown in more of the mountainous re- region, in the mountains. There's, there's valleys, there's vineyards in the valleys, and then on both sides of the valley, there's, there's mountains that go up. And what this guy started to say is he said, the best grapes, I want you to catch this, he said the best grapes are grown from, from, from the vines whose root systems struggled the most. And I was like, what, what are you talking about? He said, he said we, don't water, we don't water these things. We intentionally don't water these vineyards. And it forces the root systems to, to go deep to find nutrition, to find water and other nutrients. And he said, in the mountains, um, there's about a foot of soil, maybe two feet of soil, and then it's solid bedrock. It's solid rock, okay? In the valley, because of erosion, all of the soil has gone to the valley. There's five or six feet of soil and then bedrock. And so the, the grapevines in the valleys are good. They, it's easy for them. Their root systems go down. It's right there. So the grapes are huge. They're plump. They're juicy. And you would think those produce the best wine. But he said, actually, those don't produce the best wine. The best grapes are the smaller ones. They're, they're more concentrated, right? The flavor is packed in. It's more concentrated. And these produce the best wines in the country. And he said, in order for this to happen, the roots have to struggle. Because the root systems go down through the soil. They hit the bedrock. And then they begin to fight for nutrition. They have to fight for water. They have to, to go down deeper and to fight it. And many times, you know, we've always heard say, well, you know, God's, God's um, best wines. I've heard preachers say that, that there's a crushing process, that how you make a fine wine is you have to crush it. And we were talking about this, and he said, no, John, you never crush a grape. He said, the best wines, you don't crush them. You press them. You press them. You press grapes to make fine wine. He said, if you crush them, the seeds turn the wine bitter. So you can't crush them. And, and this is, isn't this so true about us, right? This is what you're feeling in your marriage. This is what you're feeling in your life. You're feeling pressed, right? Maybe you're having to fight. Maybe you're that root system that's having to fight to find water. You're, you feel like you're in a dry season. My encouragement, my challenge to you is to don't look for the easy way out. Send your root systems deeper. There's a passage in Jeremiah that said, we are like trees planted by the water who send out our roots. Send out our roots. I I am challenging you today to fight for your marriage, to send out your root systems. We're We're not crushed. God is not crushing us, okay? He's pressing us. He's pressing us. And this is why Paul said, I am pressed, but I'm not crushed. Because when we're pressed, when we're put in difficult situations, God is doing a work in our hearts, okay? I know it's all your spouse's fault, right? It always is. Many times it feels that way. But what I would, I would challenge you to ask the question, what's God doing in my heart? What is God saying to me in this season? What is the work that God's trying to do in me? I can do the work in me, and I can pray that God would do the work in my spouse, so I, I am praying for you, and I want to close by, by just quickly speaking a word of, of prayer over you. And I don't want this to be a transitional prayer. I don't want this to be a cheesy prayer. I don't want you to hang up because we're going to do some, some Q&A. But I really want to pray that you would be empowered by the strength that Nehemiah possessed. Let's pray today. Father, I pray um, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, as only the Holy Spirit can do, that you would, 
transcend our limitations of this technology and that you would go into the room of every single viewer that's hurting, that's, that's challenged, that's going through difficult seasons. Um, Father, I pray that you would give them a supernatural strength today, Lord. Maybe, maybe they were on the brink of, of quitting their marriage today. Um, I don't know, God. Maybe, maybe I could go be so bold as to say there may be somebody watching that was on the brink of just quitting life completely. God, I pray that um, they would sense your presence right now, that it would almost be tangible, like a blanket coming to wrap itself around them. Um, God, I pray for their marriage. Whatever challenge, whatever conflict that they're fighting, whatever thing they're going through, Father, I pray that you would bring hope today, God. I pray that you would give a new sense of hope, not because of what I've said, not because of what they're going to do, but by a renewed faith that God is for them, that God wants to renew and restore and redeem God, give them strength to rebuild. Give them the strength that Nehemiah had. If there are no miracles, we're going to do the hard work, God. And I pray that you would use us to be the miracle. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so you've sent in some great questions, and let's just jump into them. And feel free to continue to submit more and more questions in the chat. Okay, so let's, let's, let's just tackle a few of these. So one of them, the first one says, My struggle is that my hus- husband has hurt me so much. Uh, where do I get the strength to forgive him? Okay, such a good question. Um, first thing I would say is um, I want to acknowledge how unbelievably hard that has to be. I don't want to sit here and say, well, you just got to do it. You know, you just got to forgive him. I think that, that many times forgiveness is a process. I don't think it's a one-time thing. It's a waking up every day and reminding myself that I'm going to be forgiving today. Um, I would encourage you, uh, I, wrote a, I wrote a book called Half the Battle. Um, you can find it on Amazon, you can find it wherever. Um, dealing with this very subject, really, and, and in it there's this, this component called the stench behind the stone, where many times when we're hurt uh, by, by a spouse, by a friend, by any form of rejection, really what you're experiencing is rejection. Um, when we're hurt, whether it's infidelity, whether it's with words, emotionally, physically, we can be hurt in a lot of different ways. It's a form of rejection. Uh, someone who should have nurtured you didn't. Someone who should have protected you didn't. Someone who should have been faithful to you wasn't. And it can come in a lot of different components in a lot of different ways. Uh, but God wants to circumcise our hearts. Really, it's a, it's a process of circumcision. I know it's, a, it's kind of a weird topic, but it's a process of circumcision. So in Joshua chapter 5, verse 9, the Israelites are on the banks of the Jordan River, and they're about to go into the promised land, but they had all this past hurt from the past. And so God says, circumcise yourselves today, for tomorrow I will do signs and wonders among you. And so God takes them through this process of circumcision. Why? Because because they had carried some stuff with them. The very next verse, in verse 9, it says, today I've rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. I want you to think about that. These people that were about to go into the promised land have never been to Egypt. These were the children of the people who were slaves in Egypt. Okay, So God says, I want to remove the shame of Egypt from you. So what he's saying is, I removed you out of slavery 40 years ago, but slavery still remains in you. So this is what you're feeling. Okay, The hurtful situation is in the past. It's not currently happening. The, the infidelity, the pain, the hurt, the words, whatever it was, is in the past, but part of that pain is still in you, right? So, so the divorce happened 30 years ago. The infidelity happened 20 years ago. The rape happened 50 years ago, whatever it was, but for some reason, the pain still remains in me. And so he takes them through the process of circumcision, which to us in the New Testament is a circumcision of the heart, okay? So what you have to allow God to do over a period of time, a process with counseling, with help, with prayer, getting in the Word of God, is ask the Holy Spirit to circumcise your heart, okay? Ask Him to to cut away, what that means is to cut away the dead things that still remain in you, okay? So I would encourage you, if you want more on that, like I said, I wrote a whole book on it, Um, if you want to dig into more of that, um, you can also get on YouTube and Google you can literally put in YouTube the stench behind the stone, and I've preached sermons on it too. So um, great question, though, and it's a process. I'm praying for you. Uh, another question here. Uh, my hard thing is asking my spouse 
to limit time with his family. Wow, this is a tough one. Uh, due to unhealthy influences without seeming controlling and hurting his feelings. Um, that's going to be really hard. That's going to be a challenge. But I think it happens with small conversations, right? Um, obviously, some super practical things, probably things you already know. Um, I'm a man, so I can speak to the way my spouse comes to me sometimes, okay? So think about, I want you to think about um, this. Um, I'm going to talk from, from, a, from as a man's perspective, so I don't know your, your situation. But I know that how my spouse comes to me matters, right? I need her to come to me when, when I'm in a good place, when I'm not busy. Uh, her tone matters. Her posture matters. I would encourage you uh, to use words that are very, very... Um, drawn out and careful. The way you say it matters so much. I would say same, I would say I would lead it with saying things like sometimes it feels like. Um, sometimes I feel like. I would very much so lead lead with those sort of leading indicators, those sort of leading conversations. If you're coming in and just saying this is ridiculous and this isn't working and I can't believe this and I can't stand this person and this is this is really bad for you. There's a, there's, there will be instantly defense mechanisms, instant walls that come up, and you're, you're just starting the conversation the wrong way. So I would say don't look at it as something you're going to fix today. Look at it as something that you're planting seeds, okay? I love what Paul says. Um, he said, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but it was God that made it grow. Okay, so you need to look at this as this is not your job. This is not your job to do this. It's God's job. God's going to change his heart or her heart, depending on what's the situation. So I would look at your job is not to fix it. Your job is to plant seeds, okay? You plant the seed, God has to make it grow. You plant the seed, some days you water it, some days you plant a seed, but the seeds are so subtle that your spouse doesn't even realize it's a seed, okay? And, and trust God uh, to make that grow. I'll be praying for you too. That's a really, really challenging one. Okay, got another one here. Uh, what is a way that my husband and I can begin to reframe conflict in a positive light? Um, such a good question. I would also direct you, gosh, I'm trying to remember it, and some of the guys in the studio may remember, but Jimmy Evans has some fantastic content on this about how to fight with your spouse, how to fight well. Um, and I can't remember the exact name of it right now, but I'm sure if you get on the EXO website and do some Googling, or send in some emails, you can find that. There's some really, really good content out there. Um, but again, I would say that you, uh, the way you do it matters. And if your, if your husband and you are in agreement that you guys just aren't good at conflict together, then maybe when you're not in conflict is a good way to, to reframe the conflict, right? So what I mean by that is don't wait till you're fighting to try to fix how you fight. Wait till you're on a date night and everything's great and you guys are in a good place. And then you say things to your husband like, you know, I just feel like we don't fight well. I, don't f I feel like whenever we aren't going well, it doesn't go well. And we don't do a good job of communicating. And do this when you're really, really healthy. <laughs> do this when you're in a really good frame of mind. So, and, and then come together and say, okay, I'm going to do this. From now on when we fight, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to say this. We're, we're going to agree together that we're not going to do that anymore. And then maybe whenever you get into conflict, you have some, some concrete some ground rules that you've agreed upon. It's a great question. Um, how do we recognize when the enemy is attacking our marriage versus just bad things happening? Are these things different? This is such a good question. Um, because there's, there's lots of sides of that camp, right? So you can stick your head in the sand and pretend like there is no devil, there is no enemy, or we've all met the person who says, everything's the devil. You know, like if I stub my toe, uh, the devil's out to get me, right? Or, you know, they're, they're in debt up to their eyeballs and they have no money in their bank account and they blame it on the devil. No, that's not the devil. You just are really bad with money and you need to be better. Like, so there's, there's, there's such a fine line to that. And maybe it's, it's not a tension to be solved, it's a tension to be managed. So what I mean by that is, so picture this road, right? And on this side is a ditch called there is no devil. And on this side is a ditch called everything is the devil. And what we're trying to do is ebb and flow and stay, stay stable here. So I would say that um, anytime the devil is attacking you, 
it's probably because you're, you're doing something that the Word of God wants you to do or you're pursuing things. Um, I do believe that whenever we are following the call of God in our life, that the enemy is coming to attack us more. I do believe that when we begin, like I was saying in the story of Nehemiah, when we begin to do what God's calling us to do, the enemy perks up. When, Nehemiah, when Nehemiah's wall reached half its height is when the enemy noticed. Okay, So I would say if you, if you and your spouse are intentionally doing things that are honoring God, um, that you guys are taking steps of faith, that you guys are being used to advance the kingdom of God, you're serving your church, you're being generous. If you're doing things that are scriptural, pretty good chance that it, that it might be the enemy coming to attack you, okay? Um, great, great question. I want to move on to get to as many of these as we can. How can my wife and I start studying scripture together? What's the best way to get started? Oh my gosh, I love this question. So my wife and I love to do this, okay? And find find what you love, okay? Find find your niche. Find so for every spouse, for every marriage, it may be a little bit different. So my wife and I, this is what we do, okay? Um, we have this f- favorite room that we like to sit in. There's two chairs in it, side by side. Um, we like to get our coffee in the mornings. And we're morning people. If you're if you're a night person, that's fine. Do whatever, whenever. Um, it became our sanctuary. Like this became our spot. Like this is our spot in the house that we're going to come together and agree. We're going to study scriptures and we're going to pray together. And what we have found that even even when we're not getting these epiphanies or God's speaking clearly or anything, we've started a habit of just being together and knowing that this is our place that we're going to get deeper in God's word and grow together. So one of the ways we do it, and it's different from season to season, we're not really big on doing a devotional together. Um, but that may be good for you. Here's what we do, okay? We're both reading through the Bible in a year, okay? So we, we're, we're very similar to where we're at in Scripture. But then we're also just doing our own studies, our own reading. So we'll spend a little bit of time uh, reading the Bible, okay? So just spend some time reading the Bible. we got our coffee. we got our little blankets. We're having a great time. And then at the end of that, we stop, and we just pause, and we say, you know what? I, when I was reading today, these are three things that stuck out in Scripture to me. These are three things that stuck out in Scripture to me. And so I'm a pastor. Many times I have found that some of the best preaching, some of the best sermons I've ever written came out of our time together just digging into Scripture and saying, this was interesting to me. I've never thought about it this way. And so we may spend a few minutes talking about what she found in Scripture that was really insightful. And then we're going to spend a couple of minutes talking about what I found that was insightful in Scripture. And then we're going to come together and we're going to pray about life, about our kids, about all that. But then we're also going to pray into these scriptures that we just read. So if this scripture read and spoke to us, then we're going to pray into that because we're depending on the word of God. It's life. It's the sword, right? We're going to pray into that. And then we're going to pray into some of the stuff that that I talked about and and, and studied about. So this is just an example. That would be a really good way for you guys to just get started. But just think, just take small steps. Like don't pressure yourself to think you have to be these theologians or you have to read 12 chapters of the Bible to get started. Man, just start with one scripture. Just pull up version. You pull up the version Bible app and say, here's the scripture of the day. Let's talk about it, okay? So wherever you start, it's going to be really good, all right? That's a great question. Okay, um, number six, we are so busy that we hardly have any time together anymore, but I'm not sure where to start in making more space since everything we do feels important right now. How do we think about what to prioritize and what can be cut out? This is a really good question. And I think that um, this is even where I can speak candidly about this because this is where I feel like I'm at. I'm in a season of my life where I just feel like things are really, really important right now. A lot of things are important. And so if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna cheat something, right, uh, we have to choose what to cheat. Okay, so it, it does seem like post-COVID, um, just a broad stroke conversation here. It seems like COVID, 2020, everything shut down, right? We were home, um, we were with our families, such a great season. We were taking walks in our neighborhoods. Like we would walk in the neighborhood and see 80 people walking. And now we will take walks and no one's walking. Like there's no one, no one out there. And it's like out of COVID, we ramped up so quickly to try to recoup and remake and rebuild whatever we felt like was lost in COVID. 
that this is just a pulse that I feel as a pastor. I, I see in the body of Christ as a whole, but really just in the world as a whole, is I feel like we're busier than we ever have been. Um, and I don't know that I know why, but I know I feel it, and I feel like I see it too everywhere. So what we have to do is we have to become really, really intentional. And I know that's a really broad stroke, but let me, let me explain. Um, there's a really good teaching by Andy Stanley. He actually wrote a book about it, and he calls, he calls it um, choosing what to cheat, right? And what he means by that is we're cheating something, okay? So by me sitting right here in the EXO studio talking to you, I'm cheating something, right? I could be at the gym. I could be at the university working. I could be at the church working. I could be on a walk with my wife. I could be going to pick up my kids from school right now. So by being here with you, I am choosing to cheat. And what, what it does when we, when we call it that, it really makes me prioritize it. When I use the word cheat, right, it makes me um, intentionally prioritize in my mind what I am choosing to do. So I would say one a really practical thing you could do is list off some of the things you're doing. So if you're a list maker, make a list. If you're a processor, just process it, right? I'm not much, much of a list guy, but I like to process in the moment. So if you're um, vacuuming your living room, right, um, you're choosing to cheat. You, you are choosing your vacuum cleaner over something, right? If you are um, going to the gym, if you are going to your kid's soccer game, if you are helping your kid with homework, I don't care whatever you're doing, if you can intentionally say, what am I choosing to cheat right now? It will help you prioritize because I can promise you, um, if you're with your kids or if you're with your spouse, and you say, what am I choosing to cheat right now? You might say, well, I'm, an, I'm on a date night with my spouse and I'm choosing to cheat work. I'm cheating on work, I'm cheating on, on my boss. I'm cheating on that project. 20 years from now, you will never regret cheating on work. Um, 20 years from now, you might regret cheating on our spouse or on our kids, right? Choosing to cheat time. So maybe that's a super practical way that could help you process through that. Such a, such a great question. Um, we've got time for maybe one or two more. So here's one. Um, what encouragement do you have for us as we feel like we are always in a season of struggle and hard times? Is there hope on the other side of the battle? Well, I think that we could ask the Israelites this question, right? So they're on the banks of the Jordan River, and they um, go through this process, and they move into what's called the promised land. Now, the scripture um, kind of talks about the promised land being the land flowing with milk and honey. And I'm like, that sounds amazing. That sounds like I'm going to sit on a couch and watch movies and eat milk and honey. But if you go and read through the scriptures, what they actually did is they um, took ground from the enemy. The enemy didn't roll over and play dead. They had to fight for it. They had to go and fight Jericho. They had to go and fight Ai. They went to fight the northern kingdoms. They went to fight the southern kingdoms. And so what they had to do, what they do? They fought. They fought. Look in the New Testament. What did they do? Constant persecution, constant struggle, constant challenge from the Romans, constant challenge from the Greeks, constant challenge from their own people. It was a battle. Right? That's super depressing, isn't it? You're like, thanks, John. This is the most discouraging thing ever. No, it, it's not about, um, I don't think that as long as we live in this fallen world that it's ever going to be easy. What we have to become masters at somehow, some way, is by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we are allowing God to use us. We're allowing God to use us to do hard things. We're not running ourselves into the ground, okay? We're resting, we're, doing, we're taking Sabbaths, we're taking vacations, we're being smart. So this isn't work yourself into the ground. And the way that we know if we're doing it with God, so we're either doing it by ourselves, or we're doing it with God. But either way, we're fighting battles all day, every day, 365, seven days a week, all the days of your life, you will be fighting a battle, okay? Don't let that discourage you. You can do it with God or you can do it by yourself. Okay? When we do it with God, what we get with it are the fruits of the Spirit. Now think about this. We can produce fruit even in a dry season. Okay? This is all through Scripture. It talks about it in Jeremiah. It talks about it in the book of Isaiah. 
that, that we have no fear of drought because we have sent our root systems deep and we're getting a supply, a source from a place that no one knows about, no one else sees. So when we're in a dry season or a season of fighting or a season of battle, people can look at us and say, how do you have peace in the middle of this circumstance? How do you have joy? And we can simply say it's the, it's the fruits of the Spirit. How do we know if we're fighting with God or apart from God? If we're fighting with God's strength, we have the fruits of the Spirit. Um, the Bible says that you know a good tree by its fruit, right? You know a tree by its fruit. Good trees don't produce, produce uh, good trees can't produce bad fruit and bad trees can't produce good fruit. So you know a tree by its fruit, what's coming out of it, okay? We're always growing. We're always challenged around by the, by the atmospheres and the challenges around us. But if we're doing it with God, okay, we can produce fruit. We can have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, long suffering. We can go through anything with God's help. And so it's such a, such a good question. And I know it's super easy for me to talk about it and present it to you. And then I got to walk out this door in a minute and be hit smack in the face with life, right? Just like you're having. So it's something that is a constant renewing of my mind. I'm never going to get this. Paul said, I have not yet attained it. Okay. It's, it's not something that's just, someone's going to pray for me and lay hands on me and I'm fixed. No, it is a constant daily in the word, in prayer, bad day, good day, bad day, good day, fruits of the spirit coming out of me. Some days I'm not going to produce good fruit. Some days I'm going to be a horrible human being, but God's grace is always there. God's grace is always there to pick me up. The prodigal son is always invited to come back home. So um, I am so honored um, that you guys have joined me today. What a privilege, what an honor. Uh, if you want to be in, in touch with me, connect with me on Instagram. You can find me at uh, John Chastine, J-O-N, no H, no H in my name, okay? So just J-O-N, Chastine, C-H-A-S-T-E-E-N. I'd love for you to DM me, let me know uh, if this meant something to you, if it was, if it was encouraging to you. Post about it and tag me in it. I would, love, I would love to see it. I'm so thankful for you. Aren't we thankful for XO? XO is just an absolute blessing uh, to me and my marriage and to the body of Christ. And I, and I know that it's been a blessing to you too. So thank you for joining me uh, for this workshop. I love you. I appreciate you. Uh, thanks again. And we'll see you guys uh, next time.